Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want you to write this topic down. It's going to be the specific topic for today. And that is becoming an agent of change, part two. Becoming an agent of change, part two. Our focus will be understanding the principle and the power of influence. Understanding the principle and the power of influence. Specifically, I want to focus in this session on the original design and purpose of the church. Emphasis is on original because the church that I see today is not the one that Jesus Christ instituted. I do not stand as one who would criticize the church in a negative way, but I am here to address the issue of whether we are faithful to the original assignment, design, and purpose of our existence. So I want to focus specifically in this next few moments on, and please take notes with me, the original design and purpose of the church as we focus on becoming an agent of change. I want to review very quickly what we talked about in our last session for a reason. First, all humans exist in time and change. All humans will be affected by time and change. And whoever controls and manages time and change will control our experience in time and change. In other words, whoever plans your time and the changes in your life controls your future. This is why we are becoming victims of the people who we surrender our time and our changes to. Most of those people may not have your interests at heart. Who are most of the people we surrender our time and change to? First, to our politicians. Somehow we believe that they will always act in our interests and so we surrender our will and our time and our changes to them. We call it voting. In essence, others can plan your life for you if you don't plan your own life. And I would say this with great fear, that for the most part of your life, somebody else planned it. Think about what you are right now, physically, economically, psychologically, socially, politically, somebody planned it. Case in point, when you go to the food store and you buy a can of beans, who controls you? The company that put the poisons in that bean can to preserve it. The poison goes into your system when you eat the bean. The poison then connects with enzymes in your body to create a cancerous cell called a free radical cell. It exists in your body, can be there up to 10 years, and then one day that free radical cell is in conditions where it is triggered to become a tumor and begin to multiply. And the person who sold you the can of beans have no responsibility for your death. Who really controls your life? Most of you never went to parliament. You never sat in the, in the building while they were making decisions about your children and about your own health and your future. And yet when the laws are established, we live by them without having opportunity to participate in their creation. Whoever plans your time and your change controls your future. I guess the question is, who will design your life? I want to answer that with this question or this statement. Avoiding engagement with the powers that design and plan our time and change 
is to surrender to another man's values, morals, and standards. I repeat, if you avoid engaging the powers that you give authority to design your time and change, you've basically surrendered your entire life to their morals and their standards. You become a victim of what they want. And this is why in a democratic society, it is very dangerous to leave your future up to those who you gave the right to decide what happens to your life. You must remain engaged. Therefore, the number one weakness and defect of the church is its lack of getting involved in the planning of the nation. I call it the useless church. The folly of the church is its preoccupation with planning for heaven and not for earth. The church has planned itself completely out of the world. Its theology has become one of abandonment of the world and of the earth. The church has created and designed its own irrelevancy by making itself irrelevant because it is so heavenly minded, it is no earthly good in most cases. Every other entity on earth has a plan to affect, influence, and control the changes in our society. Every other group, beginning with the politicians, the lawyers, the legislators, those who are in the pharmaceutical industry, the medical profession, all of them got their plans for what they want for society. Most of the time, the church plans to leave society. Here's my admonition. If we don't plan our lives, someone else will. And this is dangerous. So what's the best way to predict the future? It's for you to design it yourself and invent it yourself. And that's causing for participation. In other words, planning is when you set the agenda for the future. We've been talking about planning the last six weeks. How you have to plan the change that you want. Every group in society has an agenda to change the world in their interests and in their favor. The agenda of the church is to take people out of the world and out of the earth. The world, as I said last session, has accepted our agenda. They are glad that we said we won't get involved in their business. The church has become an object of scorn and criticism and belittlement and abuse. We become almost like a sideshow where they make fun of pastors and they, they talk about the church being lazy and not being involved in social development, how the church is stealing people's money and how the church have no interest in people's needs. These are the attacks on this, this organization you call the church. The church also is used as a social pawn for secular society to sanction their interests. In other words, we have the church being used for a voting block in political processes where MPs, MPs only come to church when they want your favor. You know, I was listening to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and I got the CD in my car. I listened to it seven times already. And he said, I quote him, he said, the only reason why I go anywhere is because of politics, end quote. That shocked me. He repeated it three times in the House of Assembly last week. He said, when you see me anywhere, you don't need to wonder why I'm there. I'm quoting him. It's all politics, he says. Which means if he ever comes to this church, we know he didn't come to hear from God, didn't come to receive the word, didn't come for prayer. It's all politics. I hope this is not true for the other MPs. I hope you're not using funerals and church meetings and conventions in churches and conferences for a political motivation. May God condemn you for that. We are not a pawn to be handled for other people's political gain or even social advancement. There are 
people who use the church for their own business interests. Where they come to a church like this with over 2,000 people and yet a day and they come to sell Amway. Or they want to peddle their Shackley pills and they, and they come to me sometime and say, Pastor Miles, if you let me say a few words to the church, you'll get 10%. They're trying to use me to abuse you. This is satanic. You should never use God's church for your private business results. This is a holy organization and organism. But it happens. The church has lost its way because the church don't even know its way sometimes. The kingdom of God's success on earth is initiating and planning the change and not avoiding it. I want to give you God's agenda. I want to repeat it again. Please turn to John chapter 3. We'll get back to Genesis in a minute. John chapter 3 verse 16 is God's agenda. It's a very familiar verse, but yet one we don't know. It says, for God so loved what? The world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in what that son teaches shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. The next verse is important. Read it again. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world through him need to be saved. Now, look how many times the word world is used. I want to make this clear again, as I did last time. The earth and the world are not the same. Jesus Christ did not state in this scripture that he came to save the earth. He said he came to save what? The world. The world and the earth are not the same. Let me prove it to you. The Bible has two different words for these words. The first word, earth, is the word tierra in Greek in the New Testament and the Old Testament equivalent. And it means the physical planet. It means the dirt, like the trees and the, the mountains and the water. That's tierra, the earth. The world is different. The word world is a different word in the Bible. It's the word cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S. -O -S, and it means systems of control or governing systems or powers of control or powers of influence. It's a powerful word. So when the Bible says, for God so loved the world, it's not talking about the mountains and the ocean and the trees. It's talking about the systems that run the earth. The Bible says the earth is pure, but the world is condemned already. Condemned means God has already condemned our systems. What systems? I gave you a list. I want you to write it down. There are 12 systems on earth that is called the world. Write them down. The first one is the political system. It's the word cosmos used in the Bible. It's referring to this. It's a system of control. The second world is the world of government. Don't confuse government with politics. They're different. Politics is a process to enter government. Government is the system that controls what happens in a landmass called a nation. That's a system. The third system is legislature. That's law. The world of law controls our lifestyle. The fourth world is the world of economics. This is the world that controls our monetary experiences, which deals with employment and banks. And the fifth world is the world of culture. Culture controls the lifestyle of the people. This is the world. And then there's the world of civic society, where we attempt to live together and to be civilized. That's the world. Someone is using that to control the earth. And then the seventh world is called the world of social life, or we call it society. How we get to live together with family, how we treat one another, how we trust our people who are doing business with us. This is our social world. And then number eight is the world of the arts. This is a big one. It's a powerful world. World of people who deal with music and movies and drama and dance and those who deal with the internet. Those who handle the formation of entertainment. This is a world. And then there's the world of education. That's a world. It's a powerful one. It's the one you submit your children to for seven hours a day where they control the minds of your child. That's a world. And then there's number, nine, number eight, number 10, rather, the world of medicine and health. That's a world. 
And that world is powerful. That world can destroy your life or give you life. And what takes place in that world is important to you. The most important thing you have in your body right now is your health. And people can manipulate your health and destroy you. Most people, they say, die in hospitals from wrong medication prescription than from the diseases themselves. Which means that our government system, number two, need to check into the policies that they are using to monitor the medical system. Because most medicine people, medical people are still practicing. You wonder why they call it medical practice. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, we got great doctors in this room. They'll tell you sometimes they don't know what's wrong with you. So they experiment. They are still practicing. That's why lawyers are also dangerous. They are always practicing. These are worlds. They are powerful. Number 11, the world of business. It's a powerful world. It controls your life. And then there's the world of religion. My God. This one is dangerous too because it, it controls the morality of the community. There's a world that's missing. I want to add it to it. It's the world of sports. Athleticism. It's a powerful world. And Jesus said that is a world. Billions of dollars fall through the hands of the sporting industry. Now, these worlds are what the word cosmos refer to. Each one of them influence the earth. So the challenge then is, is the church supposed to leave those worlds to those worlds? I want you to think about something. Write this down. The church and the kingdom are not synonymous. Don't confuse the church with the kingdom of God. The kingdom existed before the church. Jesus Christ never preached church. He only mentioned the word church once. Once. And it was never in public. He mentioned the church in a private meeting with 12 men. He never said it publicly. And it was in a conversation where he was talking about influence. He began the conversation with a question. Who do men say that I am? That's how the conversation began. And they were quiet because they didn't know the answer. And then one of them said, some say that you are a prophet. Others say that you are Elijah. That's a prophet. Some say you are Elias. That's a prophet. Some say you are John the Baptist, come back from the dead. That's a prophet. Some say you are the prophet. That's a prophet. They're all prophets. Every answer was wrong, and that's important. Jesus Christ was not a prophet. Muhammad is a prophet. Baha'u'llah is a prophet. Joseph Smith was a prophet. The Mormons. Christ was never a prophet. Don't put Jesus Christ in the category of Muhammad. Muhammad was a prophet. Why is this important? Because prophets, whoever they are, speak for their God. If you are God, you don't need no one to speak for you when you arrive. You all better wake up for five seconds here. Prophets say, thus saith the Lord. But when the Lord arrives, he says, I say unto you. Give him a hand. He says, I am who I am. Then Peter decided to answer the question. Because he got a text message on his Blackberry from heaven. And the text message said, tell him thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Not a son, the son. Of the living God. The word Christ. Can you write it down please? The word he used. Christos. Hebrew. Mashiach. English. Messiah. 
It doesn't mean prophet. It means anointed king. Write it down. It's a political term. Thou art Christos, Mashiach, the anointed king. Why is that important? Because prophets do not have kingdoms. Only kings have kingdoms. Why is this important? Because he is asking them, who am I to you on the earth? Most politicians want Jesus to be a prophet because they want to keep him out of their political business that's why they tell the church stay in your place now wait a minute my boss is a politician and you're a politician so your place is my place some of y'all ain't understand this yet He said, upon that statement that I am king, I'm going to build my church. That's the first time he mentioned it and the last time he mentioned it. He never mentioned the word again. He said, upon the fact that I am anointed king, that gives me the authority to establish something on earth. And the gates of hell cannot stop this thing that I've established. In other words, the key to the kingdom was the influence of heaven on earth. That's what the kingdom is. The church is simply a diplomatic agency of the kingdom of heaven. The church is not the kingdom. The original church is not a religious organization. The word religion is not related to the kingdom of God. I am not a religious man. Don't you dare put me in that category. I am a kingdom citizen. Amen. I was sent to earth as a diplomat. I got credentials. Go and my constitution is in your lap right now. And my government sent me here and I got my personal legal advisor with me all the time. And he allows me to understand the constitution with precision. And my greatest enemy on earth is not the devil. My greatest enemy is religion. Because religion attempts to substitute itself for the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus Christ had no enemies from sinners. His best friends were sinners. The Bible called them the friend of sinners. He had no problems with any sinner. His number one problem was with religious leaders who claim to know God because they couldn't handle his message. Ladies and gentlemen, the church is an organism of governing influence on the earth and its environment. Write it down. The church is what? An organism, not an organization. It's an organism of people and their role is to govern and influence the environment that God put them here. In Genesis chapter 1, you can turn there now, verse 26, God told Adam why he put us here. And it, it had nothing to do with religion. Matter of fact, let me shock you. Adam was never given instruction to worship God. What you call worship is not worship. God told Adam, have dominion over the fish of the sea, that's the environment. The birds of the air, that's the environment. The plants of the earth, that's the environment. The things that crawl on the ground, that's the environment. The gold in the ground, the resin in the ground. God listed everything. The, 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 the onyx, the precious stones, the earth. And have dominion over all the earth. God gave Adam total kingdom, government, authority over what? The earth. In other words, God gave Adam the world of heaven to govern the earth of the planet. Comprende? I just said something very important. Adam was given the world of heaven, the governing powers of heaven, to 
control and manage the earth, the physical planet. Which means whatever world exists determines the conditions on earth. A corrupt world is a corrupt earth. <laughs> so the system determines the environment. Say it. Let's read about the first world. How old is the world in the church? In Matthew chapter 25 verse 34, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, God. Jesus is speaking. He said, Take your inheritance, which is what? The kingdom prepared for you how long? Since the creation of the world. Since creation of the world. In other words, when I gave Adam dominion over earth, the world of the kingdom arrived on earth not church he said it was here before the earth when God established his authority on earth through Adam Adam is not even a name the word Adam means dark earth write that down Adam means dark earth dark earth means that Adam had dark skin it's called the Adamic race it's a Hebrew concept the first man was very dark. The word Adam means dark earth. God was describing him. And you know, I got a few degrees from college. You know, I'm not a dumb man. One of my degrees is in art. I have a degree in fine arts. I can paint very well, sculpt. And I remember taking my class in the science of color in the university. We spent a whole semester studying color. Did you imagine that? And they walked in the office, the school classroom one day, and the professor says, today we're going to learn about color. And he said, I'm going to give you an experiment. I want every student to pick up a color. He had about 60 colors in little cups all over these tables. And he said, I want everyone to bring a cup and pour it in this big bucket in the front. And we poured it in, white, yellow, green, blue, pink, all these colors. And every time we poured, he was just stirring with a big stick, just stirring. And it began with yellow, then it turned to green, then it turned to red. And when we were finished, it was black. Come on, use your scientific brain. And then the teacher says something I'll never forget. He says, black produces all the colors. Oh boy. He said, he said, so what God did, he told us, he said, so what God did, he says, he said the first man had to be very dark because God only made one human from the soil. He never went back. Can I say it one more time? When you read the Bible, God only made one human from the soil. He never went back. Not even the woman came from the soil. She came outside of the man. And then out of that one man, God made all the nations of men, which means that the colors were already there. So everybody's my cousin. Don't act prejudiced around me. Come on, clap, everybody. Get over it. Get over it. So the archaeologists, the archaeologists have discovered in their research that the oldest remnants of humans, this is on the internet, read it, are in Africa. The word Afrik means dark skin. Here's my point. God took that man with every man on the inside and put him on the earth and told him to have dominion over the earth. The word dominion, write it down, it is the Hebrew word radach. R-A-D-A-H. Radha. The word Radha in English means kingdom. Let them have kingdom over the earth. Kingdom is what? The governing authority of a king over territory. He was given Adam government, not religion. That's why you don't like religion, young man. I don't like it either. My father's a Baptist preacher. See, I'm sitting here in my church today. My father taught me everything he knew, and then he couldn't take me any further. And now he allowed me to be his teacher. He's taking notes. Why? He realized his son went further than he did. Some of y'all are so proud, you don't want to learn from nobody. Thank God for a smart daddy. Hello, daddy. I love you so much. Mm. Listen to me. The earth was given to us to govern and to rule. And God, 
assignment was kingdom. Look at Jesus' words when he came to earth. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because what? That is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching what? The good news of the kingdom. He never preached religion. He preached the kingdom. Look at Matthew chapter 24 verse 13. And this gospel of what? The kingdom, he says, will be preached into the whole what? World. Look at that word, world. What is the world? The system. You're supposed to go into law enforcement. You're supposed to go into business. You're supposed to go into the government. You're supposed to go into politics. You're supposed to go into civic society. Stop wearing long dresses with crosses and hiding in a monastery. You're supposed to get downtown and mingle and find out what they're doing in your courtrooms. We're supposed to have lawyers in there who preach the kingdom of values. We need to have sports people who know God and bring sports under God's influence. We need people in business to bring business under God's influence. Take your tie off and get busy in the world, man. We are not here to isolate ourselves from the world. Look at the word again. This gospel of what? The kingdom, not your church doctrine. Not your Baptist persuasion, your Pentecostal ideas, your Church of God position, your Seventh-day Adventist anointing. He said, look, you go in there and preach what? One thing, the kingdom of God, the governing of God in that area. Y'all better stay here, getting ready to go home. We need to get busy bringing God's influence to law and business and education. Your classroom is your mission field. Look at his words. The last part he says, as a testimony to who? All nations. Listen to me, friends. Jesus told me to get involved in the nation. Don't you ever tell me, stay out of your business. Your business is my business. You all better clap with me, somebody. We got this idea, the church over here and the government over there. and say, Listen, forget it. I am in all of it because all of it is in me. We are all citizens of this country. He says, you go to the nations. Even to what? Until the ends of the earth. He said, I want the whole place under my influence. That's the church's responsibility. Look at this other verse. I thought it was great. Matthew 10, 7. Read. He says, as you go. He's talking to all of us, including your pastor and your bishop. As you go, preach what? This message. Everybody say this. You know why he said this message? Because he know you got your own. He know you got your own little, little pet message. You know, I hear dumb people talking about, well, I'm a deliverance preacher. Well, I'm an anointed preacher. Well, I'm a Baptist Holy Spirit. Oh, shut up, man. Only one message he said to preach. Come on, y'all say it with me. As you go, come on, say it. As you go, preach this message. What's the message? The kingdom of heaven has arrived. There is no other message. We preach a government. We preach influence. We preach authority. We preach transformation of society. That's our message. Look at Matthew 13, 11. He says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom has been given to you, but not to them outside. In other words, I've given you the principles and precepts for a good society because I made the earth. That's my property. I know how to run it. And I give you the laws and the precepts to run it by. Don't make your own laws. I already gave them to you. He says, and I give them to my church. The church is supposed to have them. Now, you know we are in trouble when the bishops and the leaders of the church make the laws of the world their laws. We don't like Jesus because he doesn't accommodate you. Can I say it again? We don't like Jesus Christ because he has no accommodation for your unique perspectives on what is right or wrong. That's why we hate him. He demands obedience, not cooperation. He demands, he demands obedience, not adjustment. That's what's wrong with the church. The church has become this democratic environment where you vote on things that God already decided on. How can you vote on things God already decided on? You, you ain't got no vote in God's kingdom. There's no kingdom with votes in it. No kingdom have votes in it. The word of the king is law. 
That's why Christ, I'm a king. I ain't no religious leader. Religions change by the currents of the, of the moment. But, but the king of God is permanent law. He said, well, you know, well, you know uh, the Old Testament, you know, say, you know, uh, you know uh, two men shouldn't sleep together, you know. But now, you know, that's the Old Testament. You see, you know, God got to come up to date, you know, because, you know, we up to date, you know. Let me tell you how, how up to date you are. Can I tell you how up to date you are? Two men want to sleep, sleep together. Let me tell you how up to date you are. It's found in the book of Genesis. Yes. That's how old you are. You ain't new. Sit down and behave yourself. Sort of embarrass you. You ain't saying nothing yet. These guys in Sodom and Gomorrah were so bad that when the angels came to visit, the guy says, come sleep with me. They wanted to sleep with the angel. The guys, you ain't bad. You ain't say bad yet. These brothers were bad. They want to sleep with angels, man. They were so messed up in their minds. And that spirit is really powerful. It makes you lose, lose your rationale. You'll kill just to have your own pleasure. The angel has to strike them blind. This is in the Bible. There's no room for adjustment. We're supposed to be outstanding lights. You don't negotiate with darkness. You turn the light on. Clap, man. Help me out here. You, you, you don't walk around. The church has become so diluted that we are more focused on trying to be nice than being right. <laughs> we think that love has no judgment. So we kind of build this whole thing on love. That's what's going on in the parliament. Everybody says, you know, we're supposed to love one another. That ain't true. Love has judgment. Yes. Let me prove it. Your wife says she loves you, and then you find it a bear with another man. Now, now don't get me wrong now. You got to be nice to her, according to you. You find your husband in the bear with another man. Don't, don't forget now. You got to be nice. I mean, everything is love. You got to love. You got to love one another. You got to be loving. No judgment. Don't, don't, don't judge your wife. She have a right to sleep with that man. She have a right to sleep with him. That's how we think. It's so stupid. No, you get divorced because of what? Divorce is judgment on that behavior. You tell him, I can't sleep. I can't live with you anymore. You violated a law. There's judgment in love. Don't confuse forgiveness with harboring. I forgive you for what you did, but I'm gone. <laughs> Don't get carried away. I love you now, but I ain't sleeping with you no more. You and your age can go home somewhere else. You, you, in, in other words, listen to me. You, you know, I love you. I forgive you but I judge you too. He said, he has given us the secrets. He's talking about the principles. Look at this one. He says, as you go, preach this message to the whole world. And this is why we are here. Ladies and gentlemen, look, read Matthew 12, verse 28. Very important verse. Read, go. And Jesus said, if I drive out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God's culture has hit your culture. Notice he says now, in other words, he just solved. <laughs> I stand here for effect. He, he just solved, listen to me, he solved a social problem. Okay, here's a guy who has demonic possession, which means he is disturbing the community. He's breaking up stuff, tearing up people's cars, messing up stores. The guy is psychologically gone. He's breaking up society. What did Jesus do? He drives out the demon. So the guy now is able to re-enter civil life. What did Jesus say just happened? Read it. He says what? The kingdom of God just came to your town. 
That's not religion. That's social societal transformation. Somebody give him amen. amen. We are not here to take people to heaven. That is not the assignment of the church. We are here to bring heaven to earth. That's the assignment of the church. We are here to bring change, to impact society and bring influence of God's heavens on society. We are here to make sure that earth looks just like heaven. Matter of fact, he said, when you pray, don't you dare pray to come to heaven. Let me quote the prayer that Jesus told us to pray. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who is not on earth. Holy is his name. He ain't here. Where is he? In heaven. Heaven is the original country where we're from. Earth is the colony. He said, now pray this. Thy kingdom come. What is kingdom? The systems, the governing systems that influence territory. Thy kingdom come. Come, he said, pray that. Thy will be done. Your intentions be done where? On earth. How? Just like it is in heaven. That's the prayer. Don't you dare pray to leave, he says. Pray for heaven to come to the Bahamas and Jamaica and Barbados and Kitts and Guyana and Israel and, 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 and all the countries. He said, pray for America to look just like heaven. This is the assignment of the church. I put it to you then. Write this down, please. Matthew 16, 18. He says, I tell you, Peter, upon this rock. What rock? The statement that you made. I will build my church. Now, I got to deal with this for a few minutes before we go. Because this is a very serious uh, error. When you read this chapter, those of you from the Catholic persuasion, I study Catholicism because of my work on earth. I have to study Islam and everything else. I study all of them. The Sikh religion, I have to study them because this is my work. I deal with humans. Whether it's in business or government or religion, I deal with humans. I have to study everything. And when I studied the Catholic Church, the dogma of the church, and those who are from Catholic backgrounds in this congregation today and those watching by TV, you would know this, that this particular passage from the Catholic Bible has an interesting perspective. It teaches that when Jesus answered this question and said, Peter, thou art Peter, comma, and upon this rock I will build my church. They said, first of all, he was talking to Peter. This is not true. We got Hebrew scholars around the world who will tell you that that is incorrect. There are two words Jesus used. I want you to be wise. I want you to write them down. Write them down, please. Okay. The first word is to write the word Peter down. Peter. P-E-T-E-R. That's English. I'm going to give you the Greek word in the New Testament used for Peter. Put it next to the word. It's the word Petros, P-E-T-R-O-S, Petros. I'm going to give you the word for Petros. Write it down. It means pebble, pebble, little stone, little rock. Now write another word down. Write the word Petra, P-E-T-R-A, Petra. The meaning of the word Petra, write it down. It means boulder or mountain. Both words are different, completely different. First of all, who named Peter Peter? Jesus did. Peter's name is not Peter. His name is Simon. Simon, when he first met Jesus, had a problem. He was very unstable. We know that about this guy. He would speak out of turn, always getting himself in trouble. He was flaky. The word Simon, write it down, it means leafy or leaf. One that is unstable in the wind. Don't name your son Peter. They used to call me Peter years ago. 
until I found my name. Praise the Lord. The word miles means soldier. Hallelujah. Don't fool with me. I'll fight you. The word Peter is opposite to leaf. Jesus said to Peter, after he encountered Jesus and he caught the fish, Jesus said to Peter, from now on, your name will no longer be Simon. Why? Because in Hebrew, the name of a thing is its character. Write that down. So when you name something, you got to be careful. Because whatever you name it, it becomes. For example, the word Jacob in Hebrew means deceiver. Deceiver. Remember this guy had a brother? Esau? You remember what he did to Esau? He deceived him. Why? He was being faithful to his name. I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm going to try this one. That's why you shouldn't name your son Damon. Or Damien. Now I know you all like these little cute names. Yeah, everybody got little names and things. The word Damien or Damon means demon. Hmm. <laughs> Peter means rock. Write it down. But it means little rock. Pebble. Christ was telling Peter, from now on, you will not be wishy-washy. Thrown away by every little wave that comes along. I'm going to turn you into a stable man. I'm going to train you to be a settled man. You're going to be sturdy. You're going to be strong. And Peter became exactly what his name is. In the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, it says Peter stood up from among them and said, Hear me! And Peter was a man until his death. He defied the governments of the Roman Empire. He stood in the courtroom and said, Cut my head off. He says, I don't care. He became strong. He was in wishy-washy jelly back. So when Jesus answered the question, when Peter says, I know who you are. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, Peter, thou art Peter. Let me translate that. Little rock. You are definitely a little rock. Then he changes the word. But upon that Petra. What Petra? The statement that you made. That I am the Christ. Upon that. That I am the king. I will build my ecclesia is the word he uses. We translate it as church. It means chosen ones. Matter of fact, let me help you out. The church, therefore, is God's agency through which God intends to reestablish the rulership on earth through. We are a government agency. The word Hades, Jesus used, is not the word hell that you think about. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's not talking about fire. The word used here is the word Hades. It means the graveyard. He says, this government I'm going to build with my appointed Senate. Even the cemetery can't shut him down. If you put him in the grave, they're going to come back out. Praise the Lord. Resurrection, somebody shout with me before I go. He says, I'm, my government don't stop at the cemetery. You see, let me tell you why that's so powerful. Because he was talking in the midst of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was an oppressive government. It took taxes from the people. It oppressed them. It called them half-breed humans. The Romans considered everybody who's not a Roman a half-breed animal. And they took your taxes from you. And the only time the taxation stopped is when they took it to the cemetery. Wow. See, they can, in other words, they can't govern you when you reach the cemetery. He said, but my country is different. When you become a citizen of my country, even if you die physically, the government still continues its job over your life. Absent from the body. I can't hear the church, I say. Absent from the body. In other words, your country is so secure, even death can't stop your citizenship. Give God a hand for eternal citizenship. The gates of hell, Hades, shall not prevail against it. 
Now, I thought I would give you this before we get to our next session uh, next week. Write this down. The word ecclesia, very important. It actually means chosen, appointed, called out ones. It's the Roman government's word for cabinet. It's a political term. Now we get into trouble here. In other words, the church is an organism of humans. The church is the legal agency of God on earth. The church is the administrative arm of God's government on earth. The church is God's diplomatic core on earth. The church is heaven's earthly senate. The Roman government was the first ones to establish what we call a senate. All other kingdoms before them had no senate. The group that was appointed by Caesar, the Senate, was the most powerful group of people in Rome. Stay awake. Listen to me, please. This is important history here. So the Senate was the most powerful body of humans in the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire ruled the world for 2,000 years. Dangerous people. And they were continually controlling the whole world. From Africa to England, they ruled the world. Because they had this senate. The senate was appointed by the Caesar. Caesar is not a name. It's a title. It refers to son of the gods. Caesar believed he was chosen by the gods. To rule the world. And all who had Roman blood were considered superior. Matter of fact the Greek word they use is Arian. Ariono. We get the word Aryan race from it. They believed they were superior to everybody else. That's why Jesus Christ and the Jews were considered dogs to the Romans. Dogs. That was the power of Rome. And they ran their government on this group of people that the king chose. They called them, read my lips, Ecclesia. Ecclesia was not invented by Jesus. It was invented by the Greeks. Plato and Aristotle were the first ones to invent the word church. Oh boy. You listening to me? The Greeks invented the word church. Not Jesus. The Romans invaded the Greeks. And overran the Greek empire. Took over the whole Greek empire. And the Romans, instead of killing the Greeks and destroying them, they kept their libraries. And the Greeks adopt, the, the Romans adopted the Greeks' philosophy of government. And therefore, the Greeks became the foundation of the Romanic government of the King Caesar, which means that Caesar was the only kingdom on earth that had a kingdom with a democratic mixture at the bottom. And the Greeks invented this word, ecclesia. We pronounce church in English. And when Jesus came, he was living in a colony belonging to a kingdom headed by a king named Caesar and he was under the authority of Ecclesia because only kings could appoint Ecclesias. You don't vote for Ecclesias. They are appointed by the king. I'm talking to you. This is very important. So they are hand chosen by the king and Rome was the first one to establish Ecclesia. Ecclesia was a group of people. I got to demonstrate this so you can see this. Uh, can I see? Can I have five men? Come up here please. Five men. Five men, handsome men. Come quick, come, come, friends. Come. Come, run, 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 guys. Come on, believe in yourself, man. Come on. <laughs> believe you're handsome. Okay, I want you to form, form a circle around me. Leave the here open. Form a circle around me. Just a circle, complete circle around me. Okay, a circle. Come, come forward. A circle, right. Okay, good. Ecclesia looks like this. Ecclesia was a group of people who the king chose, but personally chose them. He sees them and chooses them. Their job was to stay with him. They were called Senate. Senate. Senate is the same foundational word in Greek for ecclesia, which is our word for church. Only Caesar had an ecclesia. They ruled the world. Their job was to stay with Caesar to get his mind. So they spent all their time in the courts of Caesar. And he would talk 
and talk. And the more he spoke, their job was to always have a, pet, a, a tablet, they call it, and they'd be writing all the time. And they would write what he says and turn it into legislation and make it the law of the Roman Empire. The Senate, therefore, originally was designed by Caesar to turn his intentions into legislation. So they had to stay with him to get his will. Once they get what he willed to happen, they were supposed to make it executional legislative law and then take it to the kingdom of Rome and they have to live by it, which means that Caesar mentally controlled the whole country through the Senate, the ecclesia. So only kings could have ecclesias. Stay there for you. So Jesus said, now he's about to leave the earth and he has to make sure he establishes his government again. Remember he lost it in Genesis 3. Yes. So he says, who do men say that I am? Why? Because if, I, if I'm a prophet, I can't have that. Only a king could have an ecclesia. So when they said, Peter said, thou art the Christ, the anointed king, the son of God, Jesus says, Peter, you are a pebble. I called you a rock, a little pebble. He said, but upon that statement, that boulder, that massive mountain that you spoke, I will build my ecclesia. He didn't say the ecclesia because there was already one in existence. He had to say mine because Caesar got his. Are you following this? So he's, he is making a political statement, not a religious dogma. He was telling them, I will have the authority to handpick who I want. My Lord. Oh, I feel like going home now. He says, you don't got to vote them in. I am king. <laughs> because if I leave it up to vote, ain't none of y'all going to make it. Come on, somebody. Y'all so messed up, you ain't going to make it. He said, but... <laughs> he said but you didn't choose me come on somebody but I chose you and I appointed you to bring forth fruit in my government yes. tell your neighbor I'm so glad you don't have to vote for me because I know you don't like me <laughs> give God a hand for choosing you he chose us Hallelujah. He chose us, Mr. MP. Ain't nobody got to vote for you to come into God's kingdom. He already chose you. That's why God could choose a woman like Rahab, who was a prostitute, and make her the lineage of Jesus. That's why God could choose a murderer like Moses and make him the commander of the law. God can choose a stinking shepherd boy like David and make him a king. God can choose a vain town boy sleeping on the floor to change the world. Give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.